record session. Okay. Well, now, good afternoon, Comp 620 and 422. Uh, I'm going to cover a little bit of material on authentication that I ran out of time uh, last week, only about 10 more slides. And then we'll move into design principles and talk about that for the rest of the class period. Uh, yes, and we're talking about biometrics, there's all sorts of biometrics. Uh, did want to mention iris and retina matching because uh, faculty in our department, computer science, had worked significantly on uh, iris matching. I guess everybody's iris and their eyes is different. I never noticed myself, but uh, yes, yeah, so they use that for authentication. I also like the uh, contact lens shown here on the left, the cat eye, which you can that are sold by optometrists around uh, Halloween. That would mess up their system. So, okay. uh, oh, come on, let's, 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 uh, okay. One of the concerns about biometrics is that you can't revoke them. Uh, people can get copies of your fingerprints. And once they have it, of course, you can't change your fingerprints. If somebody finds out your password, you can change your password but you can't change your biometrics. In general, you can't change your fingerprints. So that can be an issue about using biometrics uh, as identification. Uh, and sometimes the biometrics are unavailable. Sometimes, uh, oh, okay, people are wearing masks. Uh, makes it difficult to do face recognition, although I guess the uh, Apple iPhone still works pretty well on face with masks on. And, but other things, uh, you can cut your fingers and your fingerprint doesn't work well and such like that. So that is an issue with biometrics. Uh, there's also multi-factor. Let's see if this works today. Answer to that is no, it doesn't work. That's too bad. Yes, that's a small clip from the uh, Pixar Disney, The Incredibles movie where the character here gets into her uh, lab and types in a password, puts her hand on the screen, uh, it does a retina eye scan and a voice recognition before letting her into the, uh, yes. So multi-factor authentication is very popular now. In the last couple of years, you've seen more and more of that where people are required to do at least two things, although it's been around for a long time. Decades ago, when I worked at another place, in order to get in the building, I had to put my card in the slot and type in a uh, pin number in order to get in. I had to both have the card and know what the pin was. Uh, either one alone didn't work. Oh, here we go. How about that? Okay, so much for our cartoons for today. Okay, uh, most popular uh, multi-factor authentication you see these days is relying on a password and a telephone. In other words, you. It works at ANT a lot. ANT is many of the ANT systems are doing this, where you go in, you enter your user ID, you type in a password, and then uh, using the authentication app on your phone, you approve it or disapprove it. And ultimately, instead of the authentication app, uh, they'll send you a text message, usually with a number, and then you type that number or password into the system, telling it that, yes, I have my phone. Again, in order to defeat this, person not only has to know your password, but they have to have your phone, which should tell you in order to be secure, do not put your passwords on your phone, because then if you lose your phone, somebody gets access to it, they have not only your phone, but your passwords, and they can do the truth, the two-factor authentication. Uh, <clears throat> similar to uh, authentication is a system that many uh, websites are using to validate that you are most likely a human being as opposed to a computer program that's trying to use their system. It's quite easy to write a program that goes out and gets the contents of a web page and analyze it and responds as if they were a human. Uh, a lot of sites don't want people signing up automatically as computers, so they'd like to test to make sure that you are in fact a human being. So there's CAPTCHAs, which uh, are completely automated public Turing test or uh, computers and to help computers and human apart. I believe that's a reverse name, reverse uh, acronym. Uh, so they do many things. The most common when you see these pictures like this, where they distort text 
hoping that text recognition systems will be unable to recognize it. Oh, usually put it in a background with lots of lines and, and noise. So it's difficult for text recognition systems to recognize. Although text recognition systems are getting better and better. Uh, it's kind of a fight between capture people and text recognition. Yes, sir. Actually, I'm not sure if it's captured or the other function is that everyone selects the image. Although it's proving that your human you're actually teaching the computer to be better at identifying. Oh, yes. Somebody pointed out that uh, many of the, oh, yes. Uh, I have something on that. Yes. Many systems now uh, rely on you, not just to tell you what the letters are, but which picture contains a motorcycle or which picture has a bridge. And so you pick out the ones and it also helps them train programs to recognize whether they has. And of course, once you get a program that's good at recognizing motorcycles and bridges, then if that program logs into a system and they ask, what's a motorcycle on a bridge? Well, it, it can pick them out. Also, there's only a limited number of these pictures that the systems use. So if they try uh, a significant number of times, they'll collect all the possible questions, find a human to answer them. Uh, in fact, yes. Uh, yeah, okay. I'll get to that in a minute. Anyway, uh, another issue with captures that concept, this is next slide after this, is uh, that some people have a uh, problem, you know, their visual problems, they cannot see the motorcycle in the picture. Uh, so some citizens will ask common sense questions like what color is the sky? What color is grass? Uh, now, humans will, if you're not colorblind, humans got that down, they know the answer to that. But, that's difficult for a computer system. Well, you might be able to make one that Googles up sky and find out what color it is, but it may be difficult. Makes it much more challenging for a program. Uh, and then circumvention, how to get around it. Uh, uh, again, optical character recognition. Uh, human solvers, sometimes people will put these questions out at other places and ask humans. Uh, if you have a high traffic website and you have one, and your computer is presented with one of these, and you're, you're an attacker who wants to get into a site and it comes up to a capture that's asking you a question. You take that capture, put it out on your high volume website, so have somebody else answer when you get the answer, give it back to the other website. Yes. Uh, and in my reading, it mentioned that, well, you know, if you try to get around these, there's the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which basically says you can't defeat security systems. So this may be a violation. Okay, I have a math question here for everybody. So uh, no fair using your uh, calculator, but think about this one for let me uh, get the uh, online question up. Yes, here we go. Okay, the online people should have it. The in-person people should can see it. Uh, get your cards out. Okay, <laughs> George, just a second here. They gave them back. Yes. Why do you borrow them last time? Gave them back. Does anybody else need? Oh, oh gee, where? What do you? It should be obvious, by the way, that I don't know who's who's who when you answer this because they're taking a different card every day. Uh, okay. We have 66% uh, percent participation online, uh, moving up to 76, oh, 80, these guys are fast. Uh, so, uh, everybody got the answer? Uh, let's see if I can get this to behave. All right. Uh, I think your hand is over the corner of the card. Thank you. Yes, okay. It needs not you get a card, you're not gonna even hold it up. Why am I don't know bothering with your card? Okay. All right. Um, well, the most common answer is A, 8%, which is good because that is in fact the correct answer. This is not really a security problem, but it is a, a, a math problem. Okay. You've got A and B. Let's think about there's a hundred, you're gonna make a hundred 
tax on this. And so 40% of the time you get through beasts, but before even that would be good. Now, then you have to defeat system A, which goes 20% of the time. So it's 20% of 40% is 8%. So you only get through 8% of the time. Yes, sir. Is this assume that you're attacking both of those things in parallel? No, this is that you have to do one than the other. And it works, I, I did B then A because the arithmetic is easier, but it works A then B. Yeah, if you have, if you go to A and you end up with 20%, you then what's 40% of 20% is 8%. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so that way you only have 8% chance of getting through, which is one of the advantages of multi-factor that hopefully your systems are better than 20% and 40%, but even then uh, it reduces the po possibility of that. Okay. All right, then moving on. Uh, yes, this ridiculous acronym, time to check to time to use, um, which means what's the difference between when you checked that the user can have access to this as opposed to when they actually use it. Uh, we'll talk about that again in just a few minutes when we get to uh, design principles, but it deals with when do you check? In other words, uh, typically, of course, when somebody logs on, that's when you check that their authentication there, whether they are in fact themselves. But if you walk away from your computer, then somebody else walks up and accesses your machine, they have your authority because your computer's earlier checked that it was you, even though it is no longer you. Uh, and there's questions about when should you check. So of course the answer to that is when you walk away from the computer, you should lock it. Uh, I had a system once that uh, you put something in your pocket. It was a short range uh, RFID. I don't know what technology it used, but if you walked away from your computer, the computer says, oh, you're not here anymore and automatically locked it. And when you walked up close and unlocked it, it was kind of nice. It didn't work very well, unfortunately. Uh, okay, oh, and that's it, we're gonna go on to a, a design principles in just a minute, but remember that today, today is the last, no, Wednesday, not two days from now, two days from now, today is Monday, not Wednesday, uh, ahead of myself. Uh, so you have to remove. So if you have an incomplete, you better do something about it or it's gonna become an F. Okay, so let me switch to the other slides. And all right, uh, make this work. That would be this button here. Uh, hang on. Here and share my screen and show you. There it is. Yes. Okay, we're talking about design today. There's a Steve Jobs talking about design. It was, I saw once an interesting uh, talk where they had Steve Jobs and Bill Gates up on the, on the stage talking about each other. And they asked, what do you like about the other? What does the other guy do really well? And Steve Jobs thought that Bill Gates managed to get a lot of people to cooperate, to work together because Apple builds everything themselves. And whereas the Windows environment, thousands of people are cooperating. And uh, Gates thought that uh, Jobs did a really good job on design. Uh, okay, so uh, design principles. Again, we just said that one. Uh, my point out, the, we are covering chapter 14 of the textbook. The uh, course schedule is on the syllabus, which is online. Uh, I updated it you know, a week or so ago when I finally got around to putting the schedule in there. And so uh, this comes from chapter 14. On Wednesday, we are talking about digital money, which is not covered in the textbook. So, but there's lots of them. Okay, there are the principles. There's a whole list of them. And I, I'm, I'm not gonna go over this list because I'm gonna go over each item in more detail than you probably like. Uh, okay, first thing I noticed when I looked at these principles is they apply to engineering in general that you go over that list of principles in a mechanical engineering course or electrical engineering course, and they'd be equally valuable. Most of these principles do not just uh, rely on computer or focus on computer science or 
focused particularly on uh, oh, zap yourself, uh, focused on computer security. And of course, I have a quote there from Bill Gates that software is a combination between artistry and engineering. Yes, and so today's lecture talks about uh, design principles. Some of which is cover security, and it wanders afield, by the way, in other areas uh, that aren't necessarily security because in talking about the principles, they are so broadly applicable that I thought we should mention all the applications you can use them. And sometimes they got distracted. Okay, the first and probably most important principle is that of least privilege. We've talked about this before. Don't give people more privileges, more access than they need to get their job done. Uh, I mentioned this here a subject. Subjects are you know, generally humans, but maybe a process acting on your behalf or a program that is running on one computer that requests data from another computer and in doing so will authenticate itself to the other computer so that that process can do something. It should not have more access than it needs. There's also, the textbook has the principle of least authority, which is darn near identical to the principle of least privilege. Uh, least authority says, determines, at least authority determines what effect a subject can have on another object directly or indirectly, whereas least privilege is basically directly. So we have the indirect. You can read the textbook and find out about it. Uh, in order to make this work, you have to allocate rights in a fine-grained manner. You have to be able to specify the user can do this, but not that. And also you have to give the user the all rights depending on what they are doing, not necessarily depending on who they are. A lot of companies, they give the president uh, full access because the president or somebody thinks the president should have full access after all. Doesn't he run the company? Well, no, the president does not need full access. The president does not need access to the payroll system in a way to change the payrolls when he wants to fire somebody, but there's a process for that. Give the function the rights they need more importantly than the person. And sometimes you need to give rights for a temporary reason and then withdraw them later. Some systems make this easy and some systems don't provide that. One of the things you have to do again is fine grain privileges. Some are very, very broad. A lot of systems you are either the administrator or you're not. And that's the choice. You want to do an administrative something, you're administrator. Uh, a lot of Windows stuff is you are an administrator or you aren't an administrator, even though Actually, Windows has fine grain control over what you can and can't do. Almost nobody anywhere uses it. Some poor Microsoft engineer probably spent his career making all the security stuff and putting it out there and then only to find that nobody uses it. At least I've never seen anybody use it. The university really should use it. Um, when you don't see it at home systems, because home systems, everybody runs the administrator and that's it. Nobody bothers them. Which, by the way, you shouldn't. You should avoid running it as administrator because if you do get attacked, if somebody gets uh, some software on your system and runs on your behalf, if you are an administrator, it can do everything. If you're not an administrator, there's a limit to how much you can do. Of course, there are occasionally things that you'll want to do as administrator. And in Windows, there is a run this as administrator, and you have to authorize it. Oh. Uh, databases tend to support this sort of stuff pretty well. In databases, you can specify that people have fine grained access to things. Let's consider a university system that has a database of all sorts of information on students, information about grades, and sort of stuff. And a department may want to have access to the information about grades. Well, I can tell you here at AMT, the administration is pretty reluctant to give people open access to their database. They do not want to give SQL access to their database. They have programs that will let you access that and tell you limited amounts of information. But boy, 
those of us who actually know how to do SQL, we could get a lot of useful information on what our students are doing if we could look at the database, which they won't. So let's just do that. But the way to answer that is there's something called a view. You can create a view of the database. You can say, the, this user can look at this table, but only where, you know, did, where department equals computer science or something like that. So they won't see it and you can make it read only. So we can provide a view to some computer science person saying, yes, you can see the grades, but you can only, you only see computer science students and it's only read only. Okay, that's the principle of least privilege. Uh, moving on to another principle, fail safe. This is an interesting one because it has broad applicability. Fail safe basically means if the system fails and something goes wrong and it's not going to complete the task, it should stop, back out in a way that won't endanger anyone. Uh, this is particularly, of course, important in engineering. If something breaks, make sure you don't, you know, do something that's going to kill people. Uh, and it's applicable in computer programming too. When something fails, you have to back it out so that uh, it doesn't leave an unstable or insecure situation. Also, when you start to initialize objects in an environment, they should be initialized as deny access. The default action should be to deny access. So if you don't know what to do, deny access. Also, if you for some reason cannot determine what this person's access should be, then you deny access. That keeps the system secure. And here's a question. So another poll question, let's start this up. Uh, okay. And it's online. In class, people can think about it. I didn't tell you the answer. You should just kind of figure it out yourself, or we can discuss it afterwards. Okay, the online people are moving fast. Uh, just as a quick question on this, what kind of error exactly are we referring to? If it's something like maybe like the program crashes or something? Yes, something like that. Or it could be generic, almost any error. You go to read some data and it's not there. Oh, you go to okay. access the database and the information you want, whoa, should be there, but it's not. Anytime the program does something that is supposed to work, but doesn't. Oh, okay. Facebook. Oh, face recognition worked. Okay, everybody got the cards up. Uh, oh. do, do. Okay, that's it. And oh, that's interesting. Uh, I think a bunch of people said B here in class and uh, Online, most people said A, which is printed error message and quit. Very few people said C, which is what I thought the answer should be. Uh, I think it should be all good. Well, oh, okay, I don't like B. A, there's a lot to be said for, for A. Uh, B is probably the worst, and quit silently. I just, it really annoys me when a program just stops. What went wrong? Uh, now, sometimes you don't want to reveal all the details to the user, uh, particularly if you have a PHP database or PHP system, there are settings you can give to, uh, you know, everybody uses Apache MySQL PHP. There are settings you can give to these systems to say, how much information should you tell the user? When you are developing the system, you want to see all the information you can get so you know what went wrong. When it's running in production, you don't need to tell the users much at all. Just, oh, you got an error, too bad. Uh, printing an error is good, but it's better to log the error, put the error in a log file so that later the developers can look at the log file and see what went wrong because the general user does not need to see that. 
I wanted to specify erase all in memory sensitive data before stopping. If you read in the password file or something that you have in memory and something, oh, I'm going to have to quit, erase that. Uh, just write over it so that information is not found in memory at the end of your program. Okay. Um, any questions about that? Any thoughts, comments? Um, your mileage, right? I think it should be all uh, people say it should be all three. Well, I would go for A and C. Not so, well, and sometimes B, you don't, again, you don't need to tell the user everything. It always annoys me when a program just stops. And I don't know why it stopped. Give me you know, some indication that, that there was, at least that it detected an error and it had to stop. Don't just quit. And I am, some programs do that. Oh, there's an error. So there's a stop. And you know, this appears on the screen and you go, what went wrong there? It's annoying to the user. Professor. Yes. So I chose D. Why shouldn't it? Uh, why shouldn't the program handle the error? Oh, I would expect the program in order to like erase all the sensor, you would have to be able to detect the error. Uh, sometimes you catch these through uh, uh, catch try blocks. Yeah. Sometimes you just get a error status back and you look at that and you say, oh, this is wrong. Well, yeah, when you, get that, when you get that error, why can't you uh, handle the error? Or why shouldn't you? That's not an option up here. That's why I'm oh, asking. Okay. In some cases, you recover. Yes. If it is a recoverable error, you should attempt to recover. That is correct. I was assuming that this was a non recoverable error. I guess I should have said that. Okay. Does that answer what you're stating? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Good. Moving on. Okay. Uh, comic actions. We mentioned that we're doing fail safe. Uh, what you want is atomic, atomic actions are a transaction or something that you can do that either gets to the end, works completely correctly, or doesn't appear to do anything. You don't see any intermediate results. Either it does or it doesn't. Databases have done this for, for decades where you make a transaction and if it works, great. It's updated the database with the information you want or nothing happens. For instance, your standard database activity is to move money from your account to my account. I like that idea. And so the database application starts up. It usually does something to register itself. Then it requests uh, your account information, my account information, it checks to see that there's enough money in your account to give it to my account. If so, uh, writes it into my account, debits it from your account, and closes. If any one of those situations fail, if for instance, your account doesn't exist, my account doesn't exist, there isn't enough money to move, then it will do what they call a rollback. A rollback is undo everything since I first registered this transaction. And so at the, when it rolls back, it's as if nothing happened. And that's what you often want for fail safe, to make it go back as if nothing had happened so that you don't get halfway and mess up the world. Similar, but not the same as fail safe is the concept of fault tolerance, which may, uh, may answer Jordan's issues. There are fault tolerance systems. Fault tolerance, says if there's an error, try to continue running. Now, some systems don't uh, have to be fault tolerant because fail failing, Failing is not an option. For instance, imagine the software that flies an airplane. The pilot on an airplane is just moving the wheel, which is just an input device to the computer. The computer is flying all and presses the button, it'll fly itself pretty much. But if the, for some reason, there's an error detected in the software that flies the airplane, stopping and rebooting isn't a good thing to do as you're trying to land. So you got to just keep on going. You have to have full tolerance. Usually, redundancy. Many of these systems have multiple uh, devices, multiple sensors to keep it going. And there should be contingency plans. What do you do? This is not working. What You also have to think, what happens if something fails? What is the procedural process that an organization will take if something is failing? 
through our fault tolerant systems, people build these things that very rarely fail. You have computers, there are computer companies, and I, oh, this old man cannot remember the name of the most popular fault tolerant systems, but they come with multiple power supplies, multiple disks, multiple processors, uh, each interconnected to each other. And if one fails, the other one keeps on going. Or you might have three processors or three of each, and if one of them fails, the other two keep on going. They vote every time. Did each processor get the same answer? Yes. If they did, good. If they didn't, the two processors, they got the same answer, go on. The other one is dropped out. That's how the uh, systems that fly the spacecraft work. They have three processors, the space shuttle uh, or whatever they're using these days for flying into space has triple redundant, you know, three processors, three of everything. If something fails, they check which two get the, got the same answer. They assume that that's probably right and go with that. And again, it's very popular in many places. I mentioned airplane control, automobiles. Now we have self-driving cars. Oh, those self-driving cars better keep on self-driving if the driver is not paying attention. Uh, healthcare systems, you have something that's keeping you alive in the hospital, you'd like it to keep running, thank you, uh, nuclear facilities. And something you know, less dramatic, a lot of companies particularly that are running things online are doing an awful lot of business. Uh, I went out and checked Amazon. Amazon is making $470 billion a year. That comes out to $894,000 a minute. So if the system fails for just a minute, they lose about a million dollars. In fact, they probably lose a lot more because that's sales. You got people out there looking at things who be, might be bounced off or make it discouraged and go shop someplace else. So almost any of these systems. Uh, I've been told that the television stations are very concerned about this because they want to keep showing those systems, which are all organized through some computer that picks up this show, throws in this commercial, then that commercial, and times them all up, fit them in there, so they get the maximum number of commercials that they can possibly fit in. And they all run on a computer, and you don't want that computer, or the station does not want that computer to fail because then they're showing blank airtime and people will change channels. I have an example here of an interesting fault tolerance system. NASA, way back uh, 50 years ago or so, generated the long life, no maintenance computing system. And they used it in the Voyager probes, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. They were launched back in 1977, just 45 years ago. And they were set out to explore Jupiter and Saturn, take pictures, do whatever other measurements these things are supposed to do. Uh, it's a picture of what they look like there in the corner. Well, they got past Jupiter and Saturn and they were still working. So they sent them past Neptune and, and Uranus and they kept on going. So now they are out exploring interplanetary space. They're 14.5 billion miles away. The obviously the most distant man-made object ever. 14.5 uh, billion miles is, I don't know how many, astronomical units, an astronomical unit being the distance between the Earth and the Sun, but it's many, many. It's a long way out there. Uh, they run on nuclear power. Solar power isn't going to cut it when you're 14 and a half billion miles away from the Sun. The Sun is a bright star. Not a real bright star, just a bright star. Uh, so it's dark and solar, solar panels don't, don't get you anywhere, so they use nuclear power. The nuclear power is expected to run out in about 10 years from now. So in that case, then they will finally die. This question has absolutely nothing to do with security, but I taught networks for so many years that I felt obligated to ask this question. Excuse me. 1977. I mean, I remember, but yeah, you know, probably, probably most of you aren't alive. That's a lot, that's 45 years ago. Nobody around here looks that old, uh, except me, I'm much older than that. Uh, so, so yes, what? I'm 69 years old, that's 
Yeah, darn near ancient. Yeah. So next year I should age into a new running group. Okay. So you already know this. You know this or you don't. Either. Okay. You can leave your cards down if you don't know the answer. Or you can vote if you think you know the answer. Uh, all right. Let's. Online people. All right. There. Considering the 56 AD dialogue that they have with the game in the early 2000s. Yeah, I was there. Oh, I was there. Oh, no, There's actually another issue that's really important. Okay. So people said B, A was an interesting answer. Yes. Uh, a, in fact, is the answer. 160 bits per second. You can type faster than that. Uh, why so slow, you may ask? Why is that just uh, incredibly slow? Because uh, this is nothing to do with security. But I just thought I'd mention it because I saw that and I thought, oh, I, looking at Voyager as an example, and they said how fast, I go, wow. Yes, the maximum transmission rate, you'll notice in there that there's signal to noise rate, S divided by N, that's signal to noise. When a transmitter is 1.4, or no, 14, how many billion miles away? 14 billion miles away. When the signal gets to the earth, it's not very strong. Now, while that thing has been out there sailing away, they've built bigger and better antenna here on earth. They use large antenna arrays, and they've now got a spanning the planet that they can pick up this signal. But the signal is very, very weak. It's coming from a very long. Remember the inverse square law? No. Come on. Did that with that? That's that's an elementary school, or high school, inverse square law for for light. The intensity of light or radio waves varies the uh, one over the square of the distance. Oh, come on, guys! I think we just know we can look at. It. Ah, must be <laughs> okay. Signal strength from radios or light, a flashlight or something. The strength varies inversely to the square of the distance. And if you think about it, think of surface area, think of being in a sphere with the light in the center. That light is shining on this sphere. As the sphere gets bigger and bigger, the uh, area gets bigger. So it's inverse square. So the signal is very, very weak. This is the, and this, by the way, figured out in 1948 by Claude Shannon. We also did it. several other computer things, by the way. It's interesting. Did some compression and other things way back then. Uh, and this is a basic physical law. And so that's why the probe sent very, very slow channel because they can't go very fast. Okay, moving on to other things. Another example of fault tolerance is RAID, RAID disk systems, redundant arrays of independent disks. And that is a collection of disks, two, three, five, however many you have, that function together as one large mass storage unit. The reason for doing this is that if you can put extra disks out there, you can have redundant copies of the information, extra copies. And then if one of the disks fails, and I'll tell you, your disks will fail. And when it fails, the system can keep on running because it doesn't lose any information. RAID systems can be implemented in the hardware. Most systems, well, a lot of systems, particularly servers, will have RAID controllers. You know, it's a disk controller, controls multiple disks and operates as RAID. Or you can do it in the software. Microsoft or Linux server systems have the software to do this. There are several versions of RAID, and I'll just talk about two of them real quickly because they're easy to understand. RAID 1 is mirroring. That is, you have two disks. If you're, all your data fits on one disk, you put two disk drives out there. Everything that writes on one disk writes immediately on the second disk. So the two disks are always exactly the same. If one of the disks breaks, not a problem. The other disk is still working. You still got access to your data. Typically, when one of these things fails, all sorts of alarms go off. The technicians run over. You know, it's blinking light. This, this thing has failed. Pulls that one out, puts another one in. 
and the system will then start copying the data from the good disk to the new disks. And after a while or so, you'll have two copies of the data and you'll back up and running. It definitely improves reliability. It makes writes slightly slower. Maybe you want to have these in two different channels. Well, reads can be faster because you can read off either one. If, you, if one disk is busy doing a read from somebody else and you want to read some of you can read off the other disk. But it does require twice as much disk space, which is an expense. There's RAID 5, which has a parity block, the exclusive OR, all the data on a, on a bunch of blocks, and create parity, the exclusive OR of all the other blocks. And then if you lose one of those blocks, you exclusive OR what's left over, and you end up with what was lost. The nice thing about this is that you can get by with only one more disk. So in this case, I have four data disks and one extra disk of parity information, of recovery information. In this case, instead of putting all the recovery information on one separate disk, they spread it across the disks to even out the load on all the disks. Also, there's a concept called striping. When it starts to read the disk, it reads from all the disks at once, thereby giving you four or five times the throughput that you might normally get with one disk. Okay, so that's a fault tolerant system. There's also the concept of fail safe and fail secure. The best example I can think of is locked doors. Fail safe doors is when power uh, is dropped, then it uh, unlocks the door. So if you have a lock on an external door in a building and it's locked by uh, electrical. For instance, there's a, a door upstairs stairs going into the walkway on, from McNair Hall and the walkway that goes to Monroe Hall or Graham Hall. And there's a button you can press to unlock it. Well, that's cool. What happens if the power goes out? Does the door stay locked or does the door stay unlocked? Well, in this case, the door will unlock because it needs to fail safe. People are in the building if they need to escape because there's a fire and the fire is, has burned through the power lines and the building no longer has power. You don't want to lock the door because there's no power. In other words, it has to fail safe so it locks. Other systems may want to lock the door if they no longer have power. If something's going wrong, I'm going to lock it so you can't get in. That way, if for some reason you cut the power of the building, it doesn't unlock everything, it locks secure information. So the two different ways, and again, there's a reason for having one or the other. Typically, of course, you'd have fail safe where human lives are at risk if the power goes out. And you have fail secure if you're trying to protect your data. Okay, that's principle of fail safe. Another principle is economy of mechanism. That is keeping it simple. There's the KISS, K-I-S-S, -S, which is often uh, said, keep it simple, stupid, or there's all, there's many other kinder, nicer acronyms, but the uh, keep it simple, stupid is usually what it means. Basically, the idea is keep the implementation simple. The fewer things that you have, the easier it is to tell what's going on. Uh, also, and you read the text, but it's mentioned in simplicity. I don't know where this fits into the economy of mechanism, but watch out for inappropriate assumptions about the input. They talk about systems where the they expect input in a certain format and it's sent to them in another format or another size, flowing over the buffers, causing all sorts of problems. You have to watch out for that. We will talk more about that next week. When you look at keeping it simple, there are all sorts of quotes out there. So I couldn't help but putting a couple of them here on the screen so you can read those. Yes. But uh, not simple, though. I, I would agree. Uh, Extra Dijkstra has several quotes on computing. He's the one who said, uh, question of whether computers can think is like whether submarines can swim. Mm -hmm. Or the uh, computer science is no more the study of computers than astronomy is the study of telescopes. And I don't know who said software can be simple so there are no problems, there are no problems are obvious, or you might make it complex where no problems are obvious. <laughs> okay. 
So that's simplicity. Again, it is useful to make your software simplicity. Simple, try to you know, carefully written program won't be all that complex, even if it deals with complex solutions. And then there's complete mediation. Uh, this one's somewhat difficult. Uh, complete mediation basically talks about the T O C T T O C the, the weird acronym we talked about authentication. The difference between when you checked the ability for the user to make this access and to when they actually do the access. The textbook uses the example of reading from a file. And they claim that perhaps systems should check whether you're capable of reading from the file every time you do a read. And their example is what if somebody changes the permissions and denies you reading from the file if you have it open and you're reading it from it. Or to most systems, you can do you know, most systems check your authorization to access that file when you open it. Typically, no matter what your language is, even though sometimes this is hidden underneath, there's an open command, then you can do reads and writes, and there's a closed command. The open checks to see if you have authorization to do this. Does the file, other things like, does the file exist? Are you allowed to write in this directory? Other things like that. So once it made those checks and decides that yes, you're allowed to read this file, then it no longer checks every time you do a read. It looks, just looks in the internal data that it's cached and says, oh yes, you're allowed to read and goes on. So if you do that, if you do the checks, usually that information might be stored out on the disk. You don't want to have to read the table of contents of the file every time you do a read because that'd be two reads for every read. And I'm telling you the truth, I don't really find it a problem that you are reading the file and somebody changes the authorization. I think the, you just have to say the rule is when you change the authorization and nobody has the file uh, open, that will take effect. Now it's slightly different if you have website access because typically you log into a website when you first go there. You go to the web, you go to the website, open first page, it asks you to enter user ID and password, you enter that, and then you can do all sorts of things under your user ID uh, as that person. If you walk away from your computer again, people can come over and do things under your behalf when it's not really you. Systems generally do not ask you again, are you really you when you're doing something? Although I have come across some systems where you want to do something exceptional, ask the, are you really you? Amazon's happy to send things uh, to my usual home address with my usual credit card number without verifying that very carefully. If I want to send it someplace else, then it's particular. Then it wants to know, wants to see my credit card number again. That way, of course, if somebody is trying to send something to themselves in my account, they have to enter my credit card. And if they knew my credit card, well, they could buy it themselves. So, okay. Another principle, another principle is open design. Now, open design means don't require security or secrecy of the program. If somebody gets hold of the program, well, they may be able to violate proprietary software and other things, but don't want to rely on security through obscurity just because you're doing something secret in the program. It should be kept secret because it works properly. Just like encryption it is the keys, the authorization that allows you to do this, not because you don't know how it works. Also, source code isn't always secret. Well, if you give out the program, people can disassemble the program. If you use Java, there are programs that disassemble class files and they work really well. They will come up with source code of the program that looks just like it was when you wrote it. Same variable names. So that gives me, there's missing the comments, but that's about all that's not there. Also, if you have like a C++ program, it can decode that and bring it back into C++. Dumpster diving is still there. People go out and look in the trash of companies just to see what they can find. Of course, companies want to keep their source code secret because it's proprietary software, trademark, actually trade secrets, and companies are often subject to attacks where people are trying to access their information. Some of the information they want is the source code of the program. You want to minimize the number of secrets that are there. 
uh, an open design. An open design is one where uh, people can see what the design is, but it is secure because they don't have the password or they don't have the authority to run it. How it works is not a secret. We allow people to look at encryption algorithms so that they can analyze them to see if they're secure. And everybody's using the same algorithm. Also, it's very important that an organization has procedures to handle the fact that a secret may be leaked. What if somebody knows this? Or what do you do about it? And again, there's a problem of what if you fire somebody who knew big passwords, you need to be able to go back, change those passwords, make sure that you got them all, that when somebody leaves, that they no longer have access that they should not have, or probably shouldn't have any access to their life. Okay, now we're gonna try something completely different. I'm gonna split the uh, online people into groups and I wanna discuss this. Question is, should we have open source voting systems so that the manufacturers produce the hardware and everybody runs, you know, voter 101 or voter, you know, 8.7, whatever the latest version is to make sure they're right. So is that a good strategy to have open source voting software? Uh, so let's think about it. Let's, uh, in, in person, you're one group, you're another, and I'm going to do the, uh, if I can find it, the feature in Zoom to break you out into groups. Ah, there we go. So online people, I'm about to split you up uh, into not real small groups. Go. Uh, okay, everybody should be out there. All right, think about it, talk among yourselves. Let's see if you can come up with an answer. Uh, the next clicker question asks you the answer. So talk, talk to the other people. I'm, ignore me, I'm going to talk to people online. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, you can unmute yourself and tell me what the situation is. I just got a note saying somebody wanted me to join the group. Can you explain the, the task again, please? Excuse me? Can you explain the task again, please? Do you understand the, do you understand the question? That's what I'm saying. Can you explain the question again, please? Oh, I bet you lost screen sharing, didn't you? Well, the question yeah. is, should we have standard data? Sorry? Sure. We have standard open source software run voting systems. We have electronic voting. Should we have electronic systems or should it be proprietary? I'm gonna to go to another I'm gonna to go to another room and answer the question. Any particular question about that? Keep going. I'm not gonna do this very long. <laughs>
you're muted. Thank you. How did that happen? Okay. Uh, okay, let's wrap. We, okay, got a question here. Let's let's move on and I can do that. Uh, okay, here is a whole question. Okay, online people should see it. And that's recognize uh, me. No. All right, let's try this. Maybe one. Okay. All right. Uh, we got a mix of maybes out there. All right. Let's eighty percent. Eighty percent responding. A uh, bunch of yeses. There were fifty-three percent yeses, forty-one percent noes, and some, and about the same here in class. There are pros and cons, as I think everybody was discussing. The oh, advantage of doing it is that you have more people analyzing it to determine whether it is secure. Of course, this means all the bad guys, uh, bad guys, shouldn't it be bad guys and bad gals? Well, never mind. The, uh, uh, all the evil people out there can also see the source code. And if there is a flaw that nobody has previously caught, they have all the details on how to use it. So. Now, another question here. Yes. Did you just lose five minutes of your life you'll never get back? <laughs> yes. Come on. Oh. All right, got it all. Uh, oh, okay. I'm pleased to say that almost everybody thought no, it wasn't a waste of time. There were some sort of us, and uh, yes, okay. Uh, I don't know how it worked online, but it worked here in class. So we were, uh, we might try that again if I can get something uh, perhaps more interesting than that. <laughs> okay, moving right along. Another principle is a couple more principles to go by. And again, all of these are in the textbook, chapter 14. Uh, separation of privileges. The big thing here is that the person who does an important act should not be the sole person who authorizes it. Sometimes for important things, you should have multiple people to do so. Delete the database. Oh, sure. Uh, no, it shouldn't be a simple thing to do. It should be difficult. And typically, for a lot of acts, there are multiple people involved. I've seen systems that have you have ID cards you have to put in your to specify it's you, and if you're doing some really important thing, your ID card and your your supervisor's ID card in order to authorize people. Two people said you could do this. Least common mechanism. Now, I disagree with the textbook on this. It mentions that, oh, well, if you have shared subcomponents in the software, then if there's a flaw, it makes all the systems vulnerable, which is true. And there have been cases where underlying software had a serious flaw. It was the heartbeat flaw a while ago that involved uh, TSL, the secure, secure transport layer, STL, secure transport layer, and it impacted lots of people. But the use of existing software is a foundation of programming. Don't write everything yourself. Use all that is available because hopefully the libraries that you have have been tested and have been checked. Particularly these open source things where people have looked at them and said, oh, that looks correct to me. So it is wise to use existing software. That's where I disagree. I'm not sure what the textbook was trying to tell me. But it looked like they said, well, don't do this. But I think, well, yes, do that. 
Besides, what's the probability that you can write it better than somebody else who wrote the library, particularly all the libraries? Yes, your question? Yeah, you might be talking about the problem of maintaining multiple packages in your software. Yeah, yes, I will talk about that later in the semester. That is a serious issue. What if you're using package A, package B, package X and Y, and you got them all at one time when you put the software together, and then later, oh, there's a flaw detected in package X. Well, you got to put that update in. What about package B? Yes, it can be a challenge trying to keep everything up to date. And that is a correct, you are correct, that, that is an issue. And that's such an issue that, Later in the semester, we're going to talk about that one. So good point. That's coming up later on. Uh, sandboxes. Uh, sandbox concept is that software executes in a manner that it cannot change things outside of what it's allowed to do. In the last several years, virtual machines have become very prevalent. Before then, if you had two software functions that you wanted to run as an online presence, you usually put them on one machine. One machine can easily support both of them. They can operate at the same time in the same operating system. The problem is if one of them failed, often it would drag the whole thing down. Nowadays, people want to run those two things. They'll run them on the same machine, but they'll be in virtual machines, one piece of hardware with multiple virtual machines. And each software entity will be running in its own virtual machine. The advantage here is the isolation. If one of them was to blow up, it might destroy that virtual machine that that one has, virtual machine has to reboot, but the other virtual machines will keep on running without any notice. Also provides isolation, security. Typically it's darn near impossible for one virtual machine to access the other virtual machine. So if your software is running in one, it cannot be inspected or changed by another virtual machine. And then there's the principle of least surprise. The software should act the way a user would expect the software to act. If you press the OK button, it must mean, yes, I authorize this. It's OK to run. It shouldn't do something different. Security should not make it more difficult to run the software. No, actually, security almost always makes things more difficult. You have to log into the system. If you didn't have to worry about security, you wouldn't have to log in, go through those steps. But it shouldn't add additional complexity. It shouldn't make it more difficult in the bigger picture to do this task. There may be a little authorization here or there, but in many ways, it, it should be the same. I point out human factors. Uh, human factors in area of computer science, we talk about what's a good user interface. That's all we're talking about here, keeping it a good user interface. And if you have to add security to it, uh, and of course security should be built in, not added on, but if you security system shouldn't make it complex and difficult. So what did we say today? Uh, said that uh, uh, this key points from the textbook that there are a list of design principles that are common to most engineering fields that you want to apply. You have to implement them carefully because improper implementation makes a mess as always. Okay, I want to mention two things. One, of course, uh, if you have an incomplete from the summer or last semester, you got to Wednesday or it becomes an F. And there's about 10 students in the graduate class, the Comp 620, who did not give me a subject for the paper that they have to write in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so according to the rules, I will be uh, assigning them subject. So last chance in the next couple hours, you tell me a subject, I will take your, your choice. Otherwise, I will be assigning you a topic for your paper. And the paper does count 4% of your grade. And remember, it's a three to five page paper. It's all described out on Blackboard under 
assignments. So take a look at that. So any questions, comments, thoughts? Uh, yes, I have accepted a couple different topics. Uh, I haven't accepted all of them, by the way, but I have accepted some interesting topics. If you have something that's not on my list, and I have had to tell some people to guess again because I'm only allowing a certain number of people to write on the same topic. Otherwise, it, I get I get copies of things. Okay, any questions, thoughts, comments, explicatives? All right, that's it for today. And I will see you on Wednesday. Oh, Wednesday. Yes, once again, Wednesday, we are talking about digital money, Bitcoins, Ethereum. Uh, the big stuff? Yeah, the big stuff. It's talking about the United States uh, concept of this. What? You're talking about the Fed? Uh, yeah, the, the, the federal well. Okay, a week ago, the White House announced an effort to work on, towards a United States digital currency. Really? Right. Hey, these slides here, these are up to date stuff. I don't go out and you know, <laughs> recycle this stuff from last year. No, nope, these are new. Okay. See you Wednesday.